Around the time that this service ends today, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, just north of us here, reports that our Earth will capture a second moon. 2.8 million miles away, this small asteroid will orbit our planet for some two months. While these gravitational events are common to Earth's history, it was all news to me this week. And though sadly we won't be able to see this mini moon, this relatively small space rock challenged what is so fixed in my mind and how I understand the world. And I wonder if something similar happens when a new stone bearing the Ten Commandments is brought into the orbit of the wandering Hebrew band, freshly freed from enslavement in Egypt. For all these commandments have become in popular culture today, we may mistakenly believe they were intended as heavy stones to be hung around the necks of others, or proverbial pebbles in people's shoes. But these ten teachings invited a liberative reimagination of the world, a new foundation in the formation of a people. Walter Brueggemann writes that the Ten Commandments are strategies for staying emancipated once you get away from Pharaoh. So the last few weeks we've been reimagining these commandments. Reimagine life in close communion with the holy who sets people free, which naturally presents a challenge to every idol we make into small gods that keep us and others caged. Greed, power, and compulsion, all the isms, racism, sexism, nationalism, heteronormativity and patriarchy, xenophobia, homophobia, transphobia. The sacred abides in every heart and in the heart of all matter. So resist doing harm in the name of the sacred. Resist creating God in your own image by projecting all your prejudices onto God and then defending your mistreatment of others with a divine seal of approval. Reimagine an economy built not on endless productivity, where people and creatures and Earth's resources are reduced to expendable means of insatiable, profitable ends. Reimagine moments and days for resting and remembering our original, irrevocable, unshakable goodness, not for what we do, but because we are. Rest in your belovedness. Today, the stone tilts and turns on its axis, revealing the next commandments, each of which concerns human relationships and the quality of shared life. They flow from this reimagined life with the divine, who I believe is always compelling us into closer community. And they begin at home. Honor your mother and your father so that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that lies before you. Imagine the original urgency of these words in a time when life expectancy was less than half of ours today. And in a culture whose mythic memories and stories and practices were conveyed orally. Memory was a sacred obligation and chief among the things parents are implored to do throughout the Torah. Children that honored their parents gave weight to these teachings, memorized them, studied them, lived them, and finally passed them on to their children. Those who know me well know that I have a bit of a rebellious side. Never so true as when I was in the ninth grade. There were some tense years between my parents and me, especially the day that I threatened to drop out of high school once I formed my new rock band. 
The very next morning when I came downstairs, I found my parents' large Bible open to Deuteronomy chapter 5, a giant neon yellow arrow cut from poster board pointing directly to the fifth commandment, honor your mother and father. The ensuing laughter began to heal the space between us in a very real way. To honor, to give weight to. Perhaps our life's work has been in unlearning giving weight to a new way of being, contrary to the harmful and hurtful ways that maybe we experienced at home. Perhaps our reimagination of life finds resonance in this reimagined fifth commandment by enfleshed. Care for those who have cared for you. Our definition of family expanded by necessity and choice into a community of mutual care. And we learned, maybe for the first time, the truth of Bell Hooks' words. Rarely, if ever, is any of us healed in isolation. Healing is an act of communion. And healing often begins in our lives with the realization of how our still open wounds may be hurting others in our orbit and hurting ourselves. But when we vulnerably expose them to the light of acknowledgement and truth, maybe with a therapist or trusted teacher, pastor, mentor, or friend, or among community in whose culture we are cherished and safe, our ever-healing wounds can become a source of strength, not only to break harmful patterns and cycles, but as a source of deeply empathetic, authentic care of others. To care for is so wonderfully vague and expansive and invites our interpretation. But I'd like to propose a new word as we consider all that this might mean. Reimaginationship. Reimaginationships. Isn't that what we are nurturing here? Reimagining a life of mutual care in relationship together? In a community of reimaginationships, we help each other accept that we are accepted. Help each other find wholeness and get well, knowing that when one of us does better, we all do better. Communities like ours have some inherent gravitational force, pulling others into orbit so that they might know belonging too. Because our community is dynamic and ever-changing, each new person in our sphere helps us reimagine who and what our community is becoming. It keeps redefining itself because of each one's unique gifts. And as each challenges us to understand the world and even ourselves in a new way. Many moons, we might say reflecting some new expression of the divine light we've yet to know and experience. But might we reimagine the commandment even farther? To care not only for those who care for us, but to extend our circle of care and concern to those who don't, or who can't, or who won't reciprocate. Who is my mother? Jesus asks, and who is my brother, my sibling? Truly, I tell you, it is the one who lives in love and does the will of love in the world. A second century Greek philosopher, Aristides, wrote the Roman emperor Hadrian to challenge the perception of early Christian communities as mere troublemakers. Among his description. They've taken it upon themselves to care for and feed the city of Rome's 20,000 poor. They incorporate those without homes into their own and treat them as sister and brother. And they believe that through forgiveness and love, even their Roman oppressors can become 
friends. With tribalisms flourishing and are falling further into ideological, political, and religious entrenchments today, it is so tempting to turn inward and close ourselves off and care only for our own. And on a global scale, this leads to the dangerous dismissal of entire groups or nations of people, gives us an excuse to look away or pretend not to see their suffering and remain silent or indifferent. The recent racist demonizing of Haitian immigrants in my home state has been particularly heinous its consequences profound for the community there. But even more profound is how love stood up to meet these moments. The residents of Springfield, Ohio, across the political spectrum, are daily packing restaurants founded by Haitian immigrants and refugees. And many churches in the area have decided to plaster welcome and support signs to the community in Haitian Creole. It reminds me of what Father Gregory Boyle said, that authentic Christianity never circles the wagons. It always widens the circle. In these days of dehumanization, we humanize others through compassion and care. We give weight to the boundary-subverting inclusion that Jesus embodied and breathed and lived. When we have more than we need, as the popular meme says, we build a longer table, not a higher fence. This is how we live into the hidden wholeness at the heart of existence and challenge the intoxicating illusion of our separateness. Who yet searches for love, acceptance, and belonging? Who needs the healing care of community still? May we never forget it is for these we yet exist. Reimagination ships. Who are we yet to become? And what have we yet to learn? What will we teach of all we've come to know of love? The Vietnamese poet Ocean Vuong writes, we often tell our students, the future is in your hands. But I think the future is actually in your mouth. You have to articulate the world you want to live in first. In a 2017 article from On Being, Sharon Salzberg wrote, when I ask my workshop attendees to name what each values most, people commonly say things like fairness, honesty, generosity, honor, compassion, and love. And they often say them wistfully, as if they exist only in their imagination or in some world to come. And yet I remind them, the world we can most try to affect is the one immediately around us. Salzburg calls this our three feet of influence. Few ever change the world all at once or even over years, but everyone has the ability to affect the three feet around them by behaving more ethically, honestly, compassionately, and lovingly toward those they meet and with whom they share life? What if we all acted from this imaginative space? Think of the terrain that would be covered. Your three feet combined with mine, with theirs, with ours. Imagine if we thought about our community that way. Our community's three feet, three city blocks, three garden plots of influence. Some years ago, before I had more self-compassion, I began reading several of Dostoevsky's tomes, huge novels that would literally take months of daily reading to complete. In the brothers Karamazov, a young woman loses her faith and seeks counsel from a monk. 
To her surprise, the monk doesn't speak to her about God, but simply tells her to go home and practice loving with those with whom she has close contact. He assures her, this way is tried. This way is certain. Maybe we live the tried and certain way of love at home or renew our commitment to it. Create lives there of intention, attention, and tenderness. Raise empowered children with great care who know the world is theirs to co-create with the holy and the holy other. Homes where our elders are cared for and places where the definition of family is reimagined and expanded. May we, we live the tried and certain way at church in our growing gardens and urban farms, transforming our grounds into growing an abundance of fresh organic foods that reflect the needs of the diverse communities around us. Many of you have already generously donated to the first 18 of 50 fruit trees that will fill our campus, trees planted just yesterday in loving honor and memory of those in whose wake of love we wade. Or you keep on the tried in certain ways serving at food at first, or sewing t-shirts into market bags as this church continues becoming a community for our neighborhood and as our neighborhood becomes a part of us. Reimagination ship. You welcome others with the welcome you've found. You become another's Anamkara, their soul friend, and they become yours. The tried and certain way of love always enlarges the circle of care. And we all orbit this center, which is love, and then help others find love at their center, too. We honor each other, give weight to the wonders we all have to teach and learn. And somehow, every time, the burdens become more bearable. Reimagination ships of healing and wholeness with a healthy side of laughter and joy. Let's feast. <laughs>